So we're looking out of uh, Nehemiah tonight, chapter 4. We're going to read verse 10 and then 10, I mean, verse 6, then 10 through 14. So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height. For the people had a mind to work. Then Judah said, the strength of the laborers is failing, and there is so much rubbish that we're not able to build the wall. And our adversary said, they will neither know or see anything till we come in their, their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. So it was when the Jews who dwelt near them came that they told us ten times, whatever place you turn, they'll be upon us. Therefore, I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings, and I set the people according to their families with their swords, their spears, and with their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the leaders and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you today for today. Thank you for the way that you move and minister in our lives. I ask you just to be our preacher and teacher tonight. We'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that I've learned in my years of ministry, and, uh, and the more I deal with people, the more I realize that discouragement is probably one of the most deadly diseases that somebody can have because they... They, it, I, I believe it's worse than cancer. I believe it's worse than Alzheimer's. I believe it's worse than AIDS because it's universal. Sooner or later, all of us get discouraged. Sooner or later, it's going to happen. Some of you are discouraged maybe here tonight, and you're ready to quit. Some of you are ready to quit the choir. Some of you are ready to quit teaching. Some of you may be ready to quit your marriage. Some may be ready to quit church. Some may be ready to quit your job. Some of you may be ready to quit school, and some of you are very close to being ready to quit life. Discouragement is no respecter of persons. Not only is it universal, but it's also highly contagious. If you're around somebody who's discouraged, then you have a tendency to be discouraged with them. It's easier to pull somebody down than it is to pick somebody up. And if you don't believe that, we're not going to demonstrate it, but I can tell you, if I'm standing right here on the edge of this thing, and Butch comes up here and grabs my hand, it's easier for him to pull me off than if I'm standing up here and trying to pick him up to get him up here. And that's the way it is with our emotions. Our emotions are the same way. And, and it's easy for us to get caught up in somebody else's discouragement. And so, but the good news is, it's also curable. When speaking concerning baseball players, Bill Russell made this statement. Winners never give up in a slump. They just keep on and ride it out. And that's true. Every baseball player sooner or later is going to have a slump in their hitting. And you, you either got two choices. You can hit yourself out of it or you can quit. Uh, and you just ride out a slump. Uh, so what do you do when you feel like giving up? What do you do in your life? What do I do in my life? Well, Paul reminded young Timothy of, of life. And he said this. He said, be instant in season and out of season. That's like life. Life is like this. In season, out of season. In season, out of season. The economy is like this, in season, out of season. Churches are like this, in season and out of season. That's life. Paul understood that. And so he said to this young preacher, Timothy, you need to be instant. You need to be constant, whether it's in season or out of season. Now, I don't know about you, but I like in season better. <laughs> don't you? Yeah, I like in season better. And so, uh, sometimes we just feel like that the end season is not coming back, and we get frustrated. I think one of the reasons the book of Nehemiah is in the Bible is that it gives us the cures and the causes of discouragement. 
Verse 6 reads like this in the Hebrew. At last the wall was completed to half its original height around the entire city, for the people had worked very hard. Nehemiah had led some Jews back to Jerusalem to rebuild a wall around Jerusalem. Verse 10 says, Then the people of Judah began to complain that the workers were becoming tired. There was so much rubble to be moved that we could never get it done by ourselves. Meanwhile, our enemies were saying, before they know what is happening, we'll swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. In this passage of Scripture, Nehemiah gives us reasons for discouragement, reasons for feeling discouraged. And there are four reasons. And I'm going to share them with you tonight. First of all, the number one cause of discouragement is fatigue. Verse 10 says, the strength of the laborers is giving out. Sometimes, guys, we just wear out. Sometimes we, we, try to, we try to burn the candle at both ends, and the truth of the matter is we just wear ourselves out. And, and you know what's so amazing? If you're not careful, you get so tired you can't sleep. Have you ever been there? Sure, I mean, you're wore out. You, you, and and this, is, this is what happens to you. Now, this is what happens to me. I don't, it may not happen to you because uh, maybe you aren't like me. But here's the problem. If I get so exhausted doing whatever I'm doing, either, either working on sermons or working outside or doing whatever, you go to bed and you're so sleepy, and guess what happens? Your eyes wide open. And then you start trying to go to sleep. You know, that's the worst thing you can do is try to go to sleep because the harder I try, the more awake I get. And so uh, we get it physically exhausted. When you're physically exhausted, you not only become tired, you become weary. And then you become worn down. And when you're physically down, it's hard to be emotionally and spiritually up. Hmm? Yeah. And so, my advice to a lot of people when discouragement comes, just relax and rest. Sometimes, that's the best spiritual uh, awakening that you're going to have is when you lay down and rest. Sometimes you just need to go somewhere. <laughs> Linda and I, we are, we are notorious for just getting in the car and driving up to to Boone or driving over to Asheville or driving anywhere because we're just there by ourselves together and we just talk and carry on and act like we just got married yesterday. Just a few things have changed, but that's another whole story. Maybe you just need a vacation. You know, just think about that. Farmers rotate crop, crops. If you, if you know anything at all about farming, you know that they rotate crops. They leave the land fallow. The Bible talks about breaking up fallow ground. That is actually ground that has already been cultivated and that was left to rest. And that's what farmers do. Every farmer knows that land that has rested produces a greater harvest than a land that's, that's used over and over and over and over and over again. And so, when does... You just need a periodic rest. So when does fatigue usually set in? When does discouragement set in? Listen to what he says. So we rebuilt the wall until it reached half its height. Fatigue and discouragement usually comes at the halfway point. Everybody's got energy when you start. Hmm? And it, it's a new project, a new idea, a new problem to solve, a new solution. But after a while, the newness of the project wears off. Hmm? You get bored, you get tired, and discouragement sets in, and you're ready to quit. It happens all the time. When Linda and I bought our house that we live in now, uh, we need to get a lot of work done in a very short period of time because the, we had hired somebody else to move into our house to go on our church staff, and, and ever, we had to move out in a hurry. And so we, we had to get a lot of things done, 
and we had to do a lot of painting and a lot of other things. We, when we bought the house, there wasn't any way to get to the carport without going outside. So I decided I got this great idea. We'd just knock a hole in the wall and put a door right there. That worked real good. Except I didn't know how to put up a door. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, uh, you know, uh, and and after we got started working on the house, and we would it, we were in there trying to move and get cleaned up, and we had boxes everywhere. And uh, Linda said, "We got it. We got to get this." It was the old what used to be the carport was is now our living room, our den, whatever you call them. And uh, and uh, she said, "We got to get this room done right here." Because we got to get some furniture in here. And I said, okay. So we started working on that room, and we had to, we had to kill the walls, uh, and then we had to repaint them. And the, and the carpet was, uh, was lime green. And, you know, Linda was excited about that. You know, she was just real thrilled. She said, we got to take this carpet up. I said, okay, we'll take the carpet up. So I, you know, you know me, just like a bull in a, China cabinet, I just reached over to the corner and grabbed it where I could just start backing up and pulling up carpet. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm taking this carpet up. That's what you told me to do. She said, I didn't mean for you to tear it up. I said, too late now. It's coming down. Well, we worked on that thing till about 11 o'clock at night. And I told her, I said, I'm going to bed. She said, well, we're not finished. I said, I ain't finishing tonight. She said, well, we're halfway through. I said, yep. And I said, I'll do the other half tomorrow. And uh, so sometimes about the halfway mark, your mind and your body decides that we ain't playing this game anymore. So we quitting. And the best thing you can do is follow it with your body. <laughs> follow their instructions because they know what's going on. Keep, the thing is that fatigue usually comes in about the midpoint of a project or the midpoint of something else. And when that, when that fatigue sets in, discouragement is the next thing to follow. Another cause of discouragement is what I found in my life, and I'm, I'm sure it's not in your life, is frustration. And, and, and there is so much rubble. That's what the people said. And he's talking about litter. He's talking about debris. And he's talking about trash. When you're, when you're in a building project, there's going to be rubbish and rubble and trash and sawdust and dirt. And if you're not careful, there are going to be broken bricks and broken mortar and all kinds of trash laying all around until it begins to accumulate, and then it becomes frustrating. You just have to walk over it. Hmm? Now, have you ever tried to live in a house that you're remodeling at the same time? If, you're, if your marriage survives, it'll probably last another 100 years. <laughs> I mean, you know how frustrating it is. I mean, you just, uh, the, the, you know, the thing about it is, is this. Now, me and my wife both are not exactly the same. Because I'm one of those things, if I start doing something, I want to do it. You know, and, uh, and Linda... When I start doing something, wants to make sure I do it. You get that? Yeah. And usually she's right. And so I, the trash seems to multiply. I don't know where it comes from. I'm telling you the truth. We got we got a, a one of those things that you run up under a bed. And it's a Swifter. Yeah, that's it. I got you. Not you got to have you a Swifter. We got one. I was I liked it so much. I went and bought two more. Yeah, heck yeah, I don't have to tote it then. <laughs> so I, that Linda told me, now our kids are coming up here Christmas. And so Linda's trying to get up all of all the quilts and all that kind of stuff. And she said, well, would you take that Swifter and see if you can clean some of this out of these beds? I said, okay. I ran that Swifter up under that bed. And when I drew that thing back, son, there was enough of dust and dirt come out from under there. I told Linda, I said, what have you been doing under the bed? She said, I ain't been doing nothing. I said, somebody has. There ain't no way that kind of dust and dirt could have got under my bed. Well, it did. And uh, 
You know, and, and, yeah. Let me talk about swifters. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that you never turn your swifter on and it be charged up? It, you click it on and it go, mm. So then you have to go back in there and plug it up, leave it plugged up. So now I got all three of mine plugged up. Yeah, son, I just go, when one of them goes dead, I just grab another one and go up under another bed, you know, just like that. <laughs> it just, it just, it just happens. I mean, it stuff just builds up in your house. And, uh, and Linda's a neat freak. And so, and, and, and I'm not one of those neat freaks. And so Linda, uh, it, 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 I, maybe she'll listen to this sermon. I doubt it. That's the reason I can say what I want to. Uh, she's one of those things that feels like that all your shoes need to be in the closet. Nah, no, no. There ain't no reason to put them in the closet. You just got to get them back out. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, you're going to have to wear them again. So you might as well just leave them where I took them off. And now that makes sense to me. You know what I'm saying? But it don't make much sense to her. You know, she, she said, you're going to have to do something with all her shoes. I said, baby, there ain't but five pairs sitting out here on the floor. You know, I mean, you know, one of them was a pair of boots and one of them was a pair of flip-flops. One of them was a pair of shoes like this. And one of them was my work shoes. And I mean, shoes, I, I use them all. Now that, now that makes sense. Dale, don't that make sense to you? Thank you, son. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Sue. I know it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, so, fatigue. The fourth cause of discouragement is fear. Verse 11 says, also, also our enemy said, before they see us, we'll be right there among them and we'll kill them and put them at an end to their work. Fear is one of the greatest uh, difficulties that you're going to have to overcome in your life. Because everybody has some measure of fear. In their life. Uh, and that's, that's just the way God made us. He wired us up that way. What my fear may not be yours and your fear may not be mine. But uh, the background of this story is that there were some enemies who did not want the wall to be rebuilt around Jerusalem. And so they were doing everything they could not to build a wall. And so... First, they ridiculed the Jews, and then they criticized the Jews. And finally, they began to threaten the Jews by saying, we're going to kill you. Nobody likes to be criticized. And nobody likes to be afraid either. So who gets afraid? Well, verse 12 says, Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, Wherever you turn, they're going to attack us. Then you constantly live in this listening to negative people. Now, you've heard me say from the pulpit, you heard me say it down here, I don't like being around negative people. I like to be around people that's, that's positive. So fear causes us to be discouraged. Fear of embarrassment, fear of failure, fear of having to be perfect, fear that you can't handle the pressure. So, how do you get through all of this? Well, the first thing, and we talked about it, is you just need to rest. Rest your body. The first thing Nehemiah did was he gave a little rest to everybody. When you read the whole chapter of Nehemiah, I actually proclaimed some holidays. And it's amazing how much better sometimes things look after a good night's rest or after a couple of days off. Psalm 127, 2 reads like this in the New Living Translation. God wants his loved ones to get their proper rest. Some of you need to underline that, put it on your refrigerator. The Bible says it is vain for you to rise up early and stay up late. Did you know that was in the Bible? 
Yep, it is. And my wife believes that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, son, she is not a morning person. And it, at, at sometimes, you know, about 10 o'clock, I think, I might better go check on her, and I'm thinking, I ain't waking that up. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll wait till later. <laughs> Psalm 119, 73 reads like this in the Hebrew, You made my body, Lord. Now give me sense to heed your laws. You need to eat right. You need to sleep right. You need to exercise, and you need to relax. Balance. You ought to have some balance in your life. Your rest is important to God. If you ignore it, you're going to get discouraged. Then the second thing is Nehemiah brings out in verse 13, and that is recognize your life. Listen to what he said. Therefore, I was stationed some of the people behind the lowest parts of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by their families with their swords, with their spears, and with their bows. In other words, we, you're going to have to set some priorities in your life. Yeah, you know, you're not going to have time for everything. So you're going to have to determine what you're going to have time to do. What's more important in your life? God, family, church. That's, that's how God gave it to us. This is what, the, the, you, you study the book and you'll find out that our priority, first of all, is God. Our second priority is to our family and then our next priority is to the church and, and ministry. Now, I'm going to tell you something, guys. I know a lot of preachers that's got this thing mixed up. They got God, and then the church is next in their priorities. And they neglect their families. Hmm? Hello? We talked about it in staff meeting time and time again. Son, it's no wonder a lot of church. Uh, a lot of preacher's kids aren't in church today because their daddy was married to the church instead of the mama. Are you listening to me? So make sure things are, are that are in gear and focus on that. Know what, near my, uh, grouped them up my families. That's why, that's why we need church. Over and over and over, the Bible says one another, serve one another, love one another, help one another, care for one another. Pray for one another, greet one another, encourage one another. Fifty times in the New Testament, that phrase, one another, is because we need each other. We need each other. Now, the th th my tooth just went blind. The third thing is this. Remember the Lord. Verse 14 said, after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Typically, when we get discouraged, what has happened is we have gotten our eyes off the Lord and on a problem. Ever so often, you hear people say, under the circumstances. I'm doing pretty good under the circumstances. Well, get out from under them. You don't have any business being under a circumstance. You have authority to be over it. So what do you do? You need to remember when you're discouraged three things. And this is what I, we're going we're to close on, on these three things. <clears throat> remember God's goodness to you in the past. Start making a list of things that have been, been good about life. All the things that have been positive about life. Now Jan and I, Jan and I have been talking, we, we, we were talking actually in meeting this afternoon. But we were talking before the staff meeting. Man, I'm telling you, our whole staff is a bunch of miracles. Did, did you know that? Yeah. Listen, Larry has had heart issues and heart surgery. Burkheimer's had a stroke. Jen has overcome cancer. Me and Linda have overcome cancer, both of us, in the last three years. I mean, you look at our staff, we're just a bunch of miracles. When Josh was on that, was on that uh, mission trip, they, he took the wrong kind of medicine, and he's still, still not exactly right. You understand what I'm saying? Well, none of us are exactly right, I don't think, you know. But uh, we were looking, we, Jen and I were just sitting there in, in the conference room looking around. Man, you're looking at a bunch of miracles, you know? The truth of the matter is, all of us could be dead. 
I mean, the doctor told me, I had, told, he didn't tell me, he told my kids that I didn't have a 5% getting off the table. Off the, I, I was surgeon. And then he said I probably didn't have a 7% for living another year. Well, thanks for the encouragement, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and we just look and see. Jan and I just, Jan and I can have a, a running fit. One day, and we may have one one of these days pretty soon. But when you just see what God has done in this church, just among our staff, how many miracles that God has done throughout this church. And it's awesome. It's awesome. So always remember, God is a good God. He never makes a mistake. And he's full of grace and mercy. And he's still the healer. And I think that's just need to recognize the, what God has done in the past. The third thing is, is to... Uh, remember what God is doing in right now. And I just tied these two together. He, if, he, if he could do it then, he could do it again. Isn't that right? If he could do it then, he can do it again. If he could bring a great awakening in this nation then, he can bring another one today. You understand? We, the problem that we have, <coughs> me and Jen's going to preach our conversation here in a minute, the problem is what we have, we handcuff God. You know what? If you think small, you're going to act small. But if you think big, then you can tackle it. Amen? Yeah. So Jen and I, we've made this, we made this promise. We've claimed it. We've confessed it. 2019 is going to be the greatest year that this church has ever had. And you say, well, how are you going to make it happen? I'm going to tell you how we're going to make it happen. We're going to get up off our duff and start doing what God's called us to do. Hmm? Our staff can't do it by ourselves. We got to have some help. We got to have some help. And we got to get the people involved in this church involved in this church. You understand what I'm saying? There's more than just coming on Sunday morning, punching your ticket and going back home. You need to get involved in what God has called you to do. There, is, there are needs in this church that you can fulfill. You say, well, I don't know what they are. Well, I didn't find out. You understand what I'm saying? Now, remember this. If God was good in the past and he's awesome in the present, then he's probably in charge of the future. Isn't that right? Over and over again, the Bible is full of promises. And God says, as your days are, so shall your strength be. He says, I'll give you power. I'll help you. Over and over and over and over, God has made promises. He said, I, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, he said, I'll help you. I'll strengthen you. I'll, I'll see you through this. So get your mind off the discouraging circumstances and get your mind on the Lord. Psalm 119, 25 said, I'm completely discouraged. I lie in the dust. Revive me by. By what? By television? By going to a good restaurant? By going to Belks? Or going to Tahiti? Nope. Revive me by your word. You know the quickest antidote for discouragement is to get in the word of God. Just get in the word of God and start looking for promises. There are a lot in there. You know? And you've heard me say it a lot. You cannot believe what you do not know. If you don't know what's in that book, you can't believe it. You know, people say, well, I just believe the Bible is the Word of God. It is. But it won't do you any good if you don't know what's in it. Isn't that right? Does that make sense to you? Sure it does. So this is what you need to do. Resist this, this discouragement. Nehemiah said, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord is great and awesome. And fight for your brothers and your sons and your daughters and your wives and your home. Don't give don't give up. Resist in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Resist the discouragement. Resist the desire to quit sometimes. And it's not hard. It's not hard to quit. Sometimes it's hard to keep going. You understand what I'm saying? Dale and I are involved in a ministry that could absolutely cause you want to blow your own brains out. Because I tell you, I have been clean 
And you've heard me say this until you're sick of it, but you're going to hear it one more time. We're in a business where we deal with addicts. I've been clean for 50-something years, and I could start back tomorrow. I could start back tomorrow. I could take a left tomorrow. I know where, where I could go get it. Hmm? You said, well, what keeps you going? That right there. When Satan gets in your brain, you're defeated. You listen to me? Your thoughts are going to go crazy. You're going to become discouraged. You're going to look at yourself as, as unworthy. You're going to see yourself as unfit. You're going to be filled up with guilt. And all these things are going to take off in your mind. And Satan's got you. Amen. You listen to me carefully. Before you ever committed adultery, you already had it in your mind. Are you listening? Hello? Before I ever did my first drugs, I already wanted to. Right up here. Hmm? Amen. Now, I know some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about. But I'm, we're going to do a series down here on Wednesday nights. And it's called, It's All About Your Mind. And I promise you this. Jesus said, not Clifton, Jesus said, out of the mouth comes the abundance of your heart. Before it ever comes out of here, you already thought it. Hmm. So I didn't mean to say that. Yes, you did. You meant to say it. You said it on purpose. Now you're going to lie about it. I didn't mean to say that. Yes, you did. You meant to. Hmm? Amen. Somebody said, well, what caused you to get in drugs? Me? I was the cause I was on drugs. I was the cause I ended up in a psycho ward for drugs. I was the I was. The, it was my fault. Oh, it was because your daddy wasn't at home. <laughs> you fool. Hmm. You know what Dale, Dale and I tell our guys and our girls? You get right with the guy in the mirror. You can get it right. As long as I could blame somebody else, I had an excuse. But when I got it right with the guy in the mirror, I realized it was me. Discouragement. Fight it. Stand against it. Confess it. Confess your victory. Hmm? Amen. All right. Who are we praying for tonight?